So today's reading is Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 21. Uh, so please do uh, look that up in your Bibles if you can. That's Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, they were, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons, your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my, on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Thank you, Carl, very much indeed. You'll be glad to know that we did give Carl prior warning with all those names. Uh, Some people's worst nightmare is waking up uh, to think they're going to have to read something like that. So thank you so much, Carl, for reading for us. Now, over the next 12 weeks, we are looking at these six speeches that changed the world. Uh, And there's no doubt that the world has been substantially altered by these six speeches. Uh, It occurred to me as I was pondering uh, this passage today, that we could even, uh, that we're even having the conversation, the loud conversation in Britain about us keeping our word in international negotiations, is a result, at least in part, of my word is my bond, which is a fundamentally Christian idea. So, all over the world, Christian virtues, Christian buildings, Christian leaders, Christian countries, Christian legal systems, and so forth. No doubt that the world has been substantially altered by these six speeches. No doubt that we want our world to change, that Greta wants the world to change, Black Lives Matter want the world to change, Joe Biden wants the world to change, the Me Too campaign, and that's before we get to things like COVID. These six speeches then that changed our world. Last week, we saw that the central hero, the star character of every one of these speeches, the whole of this book of Acts, in fact, is the Lord Jesus Christ, that we could even rename the book the ongoing acts of the Lord Jesus. We looked at his historical achievements and his life-changing gift. And we saw the agenda of the Lord Jesus the global advance of the gospel. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. Well, today we come to the first major sermon in the Christian church. The date is 33 AD. The place is Jerusalem. The festival is Pentecost. And gathered in Jerusalem are people, both resident aliens and visitors, from all across the known world. 
Pentecost occurred 40 days after Passover. It was a kind of harvest festival and also an event when God giving revelation to Moses was remembered. And I take it that many who had come up for Passover 40 days earlier were still in Jerusalem. Well, this first sermon uh, breaks into two major parts. And so you can see the first time in verse 14, Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. And he announces, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. And then again in verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. And so we're going to take the sermon in two parts, one part this week and one part the next. Before we get into it, notice as we go through that it is both loaded with content, full of persuasive argumentation and careful logic, but it also packs a punch. So look at verse 21. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look at verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And then again in verse 37, when they heard it, they were cut to the heart. What should we do? Repent and be baptized, every single one of you. Now, immediately that tells us a thing or two about Christian preaching, it seems to me. You hear some say that Christian preaching should be filled with emotive appeal and entertaining anecdote as a speaker urges his hearers and woos his hearers and entertains his hearers and wins his hearers. All style, little substance. Well, that's not what we've got here. And what we're about here on Tuesdays is not simply entertainment or titillation or manipulation. No, we leave that to the cults. That is careful argumentation, thorough investigation. But at the same time, you sometimes hear people say that, well, sermons should have no appeal. And they shouldn't have a kind of reaching out to the congregation and asking for action. Well, you can't possibly say that. If you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 37, well, they're cut to the heart. What should we do? Repent and be baptized. Verse 21, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So insofar as we can treat this as a model sermon, so far is Christian preaching to be persuasive argumentation from objective truth with convincing logic, and at the same time, passionate appeal on the back of it. Well, as I say, we're going to split into two uh, weeks, this great sermon, and this week we're going to look at the last days, as Peter describes these last days. And we're going to look first at the power for Christian preaching, and then the summons that is to go out across the world and down through the ages. Well, before we get into it, just glance again at verse 21 and the final point of where we're going. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so if you want to know what Christian preaching is, where it's driving, it is a summons to call on God for salvation. It's not primarily about uh, being a better person or improving your life chances or joining God's team because God needs a helping hand from a city worker or two or filling your head with religious knowledge or blocking out your diary for a whole new social set. This sermon is driving for a conviction, and for an action to call on the name of the Lord for salvation. And it begs the question, salvation from what? Of the next financial crisis, COVID, wildfires, and I'm going to seek to persuade you that we are to call on the name of the Lord for salvation from God. You need saving from God. 
Well then, let's get into it. Uh, These last days of salvation, the power for Christian preaching. In verses 1 to 4, there are 120 disciples. They're all together. I suspect there's little social distancing. And all of a sudden, there's this huge sound. The noise is so loud that in verses 5 and 6, a whole multitude gathered. But before the multitude assembled, divided tongues as of fire, verse 3, appeared to the 120 and rested on each one of them. And as the sound came, so the tongues descended. Do notice immediately that it was not actual fire. They were tongues as of fire. They just looked like it. And there was not an actual wind. There was just a sound of a wind. You know, sometimes you hear people refer to this event and suggest that when the Spirit comes, oh, well, you'll feel a faint breeze on your face and you might feel a warm glow. Most importantly, we see that they speak in tongues. And that leaves us asking, well, what were these tongues? And in verses 5 through 11, an explanation is provided. Now, they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And then verse 11, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Now, the word language there is the word dialect. We hear them speaking in our own dialect. So here are the crowds. Many are resident aliens. Others have traveled into Jerusalem. So it, the scene might be reminiscent of Oxford Street at Christmas time in a, a non-pandemic season, or perhaps the tube coming in from Newham on a busy weekday rush hour. And here are the 120 disciples. And each one, as the Spirit descends, speaks the particular native dialect of all these nations that are gathered in front of them. It's worth uh, noting that this is the only place in the New Testament when the phenomenon of tongues is explained in detail And so again, sometimes you hear people say that speaking in tongues is a matter of speaking in gobbledygook. But here it can only be recognizable human language coming as a supernatural event as these disciples start speaking the languages of the known world. It is a communication event, and it's a supernatural event. The Holy Spirit enables unschooled Galileans with no GCSEs in Parthian or Arabian and no language laboratories to go and brush up on it, and suddenly they're able to speak these languages and communicate the mighty works of God. Many is the prayer of the A-level student when sitting their exams that this gift might descend upon them. But still, we're not told what it actually means. And so Peter then stands up with the 11 other apostles. I take it sounds almost like they're speaking together and explains the phenomenon. Peter, standing with the 11, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. That's it's nine o'clock in the morning, and they're not brokers. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. So Peter's explanation of this supernatural event comes using the words of the Old Testament prophet Joel. And as he quotes from the Old Testament prophet Joel, he references two time frames. 
The first time frame is there in verse 17. In the last days it shall be, God declares. Now, God was, uh, Joel was the great prophet of judgment. Uh, he speaks of God's final judgment in terms of a locust swarm descending upon people. And he pictures God's judgment as a swarm of locusts. But before judgment day comes, the day... There is to be a period known as the last days. You can see it there in verse 17. In the last days it shall be, God declares. And in this phase of history, this era, this eon, this age, this final extended moment of time, throughout this age, whereas prior to the age beginning, God communicated occasionally from time to time, through very specific select individuals. Now God is going to pour out his spirit, look at it there, on all flesh, such that your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even male servants and female servants in those days will prophesy as his Holy Spirit is poured out on all believers. Now, do you notice the scope of it there? old and young. You notice the span of it there, all flesh. You notice the spectrum of it there, male and female, male servants and female servants. It is, if you like, a democratization of God's revelation. Everybody will be able to speak about God and what he has done. Now, we're nearly ready to begin to apply this, but before we do so, one last thing we need to get straight. Joel wrote five to seven hundred years before the coming of Christ. For Joel, what was being communicated was the great plan of God to save people from judgment. God communicated this plan to Joel and the people of Joel's day through dreams, through visions, through words of prophecy. And therefore, in Joel's kind of terms of reference, for Joel to dream a dream was for Joel to be shown something of God's saving plan. For any one of the other prophets of the Old Testament, Ezekiel who had all those extraordinary visions, for Ezekiel to have a vision was to be shown something of God's saving plan. For Daniel or Joseph... When they were spoken to by God in a word of prophecy, it was about God's saving plan. So when Joel says, God will pour out his spirit and all his children will dream dreams or have visions, he's not necessarily saying, we're all going to wake up with a sore head, saying to ourselves, wow, that was a night. What was going on in that dream? Now, that's not what actually happened in verses 1 to 11. What happened in verses 1 to 11 is they spoke about the mighty works of God that had been shown to them in the person of Jesus Christ. And so Joel is anticipating a day when every single believer, young and old, rich and poor, male and female, powerful and marginalized, will be able to speak with confidence and certainty concerning the saving plans of God. Every believer. Again, I stress that because alongside some people saying, oh, well, you'll still feel warm and fuzzy when the Holy Spirit comes or you'll feel a breeze on the face when the Holy Spirit comes or you'll speak gobbledygook when the Holy Spirit comes. Some people also suggest that when the Holy Spirit comes, oh, we're all actually going to be having dreams and waking up in the morning, scratching our head and thinking, what on earth was that all about? That there's a whole range of different ideas knocking around subjective mini-me revelations, you might say. But now in Joel's language, to dream a dream is to be shown the mighty work of God. And these believers, they've seen Jesus. They've seen the mighty work of God. And so uh, Peter's point is this. Look, these last days have come come upon us. These last days are now with us. We are now living in the last days because every one of these 120 people are speaking of the saving work of Jesus Christ. 
And I was thinking to myself, you know, like preachers do across the world, well, how are we going to illustrate this? I suddenly realized that I don't actually need to just come and visit our Sunday school. You come and visit our Sunday school, you'll find a three-year-old there tottering out of Sunday school talking about Jesus. In fact, in a rather more straight way than Joel was in some of his visions and dreams. In fact, you find a five-year-old going home for a weekend visit to visit granny and grandpa who don't know about Jesus, sitting at the breakfast table because he's now been brought up in a Christian family and saying to granny, granny, don't you follow Jesus? Why not? He's God's king. He's doing what Joel does, speaking the mighty works of God in intelligible language, filled with the Holy Spirit. Sunday morning, I was kind of ready for everything that was going on that Sunday a little bit earlier than usual, so I went for a little walk outside, just at 22 Bishop's Gate. There was a security guard, got chatting to the security guy. He was from Ethiopia. And I said to him, uh, you know, have you heard of the Lord Jesus? Well, a broad grin came across his face. He explained to me the Christian gospel, assuming that I hadn't. And then he stood, and I said, well, actually, I do know about the Lord Jesus, etc., etc., etc. And then he stood next to me like this, and there he was, as Ethiopian as you like. And there was me, pale and anemic. And he, with a broad grin, said, we're brothers, you know. We have the same father. Well, there it is. All over the world, all flesh, rich and poor, male and female, educated and illiterate, powerful and marginalized, anybody who trusts the Lord Jesus now, able to speak with equal authority to Elijah, Elisha, Moses, Joel, as they declare the mighty works of God. So go to the refugee camp, come across a Christian, they speak the gospel to you, there is evidence that we're in the last days. Head off to Beijing or come to our two o'clock Mandarin service. Get chatting to the Mandarin guys afterwards, and thankfully they break into English, but otherwise you can hear them all chattering away in Mandarin, speaking about the mighty words. We're in the last days. You see the diversity of this. You see the democratization of this. You see the beauty of this. The youngest child in your Sunday school with the words of the mighty works of God is a prophet proclaiming just as any preacher in his pulpit. And you, and you. If you've turned to the Lord Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, and you are able to speak the mighty works of God. But Joel, whom Peter quotes, doesn't actually stop there. He's referenced one time period, and in verses 19 and 20, he references a second. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and the vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who turns on the Lord calls on the Lord, will be saved. So you see, we got the era, the eon, the age, the phase of history, the last days. Then there's the day of the Lord, the great and magnificent day. And that's primarily what Joel is on about, the coming day of God's judgment. Now, I'm not going to embark at this point on a lengthy defense on God's right to judge you and me. That God, the creator, should hold his creation to account is as reasonable as the city worker having an end-of-year review or the undergraduate having finals. We all believe in accountability. You see it all over the media, the Hillsborough survivor, the Grenfell relative, the Savile victim, the Me Too victim. We all believe in accountability and judgment. You expect an end-of-year audit. You appeal against an unjust result from a wonky algorithm. You demand a second opinion. You believe 
in accountability and justice. All of us expect it, and so does God. And the great and magnificent day of the Lord is the point at the end of world history when the clock stops, the final whistle is blown, the curtains are drawn, and the play ends. That is the day when he will judge all greed, all pride, when he will expose all maltreatment of others, he will bring every misdemeanor to justice, and most of all, he will be exalted and recognized by all and those who have ignored him and those who have neglected him and those who have treated him as a bit part extra will face his wrath. And verses 19 and 20 here speak of mighty signs and supernatural wonders that precede this coming day. And once again, we're going to see next week that Peter tells us that those mighty works have taken place in and through Jesus Christ. And so here we have Christian preaching. A window has opened. We're in the last days. A phase of history has begun. An era has started when every single believer will have the Holy Spirit and will speak in power with confidence about the Lord Jesus Christ. A day is set, a day is set when God will come in judgment on all flesh. But now, everybody who calls on the name of the Lord have the opportunity to be saved from his judgment. How is Christian preaching enabled? By his power. So important we get this right. The work of God the Holy Spirit is not to give us warm, tingly feelings or cold air on the face or speak gobbledygook. It is to enable us to communicate the gospel. That's his great agenda. Who does it? The people of God. The people of God do it. It is a communication masterpiece, masterstroke. I mean, if Apple were able to do this, that every single person with an Apple iPhone, with an iPhone, was able to communicate the mighty, well, some of them actually rather boringly do, don't they? But if every single one of them, from the youngest to the oldest, across the globe, it's a communication masterstroke. And then there's the appeal to call upon the Lord to be saved. You know, there's no doubt the world needs saving from COVID, from climate change, from corruption. And I suspect one or two of us will feel we need saving from particular issues facing us. But the Christian gospel tells us we need saving from God and from his wrath, from his judgment. And you will find it wherever you cut Christian teaching open. Jesus Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. John the Baptist, even now the axe is at the root. Paul, the wrath of God is revealed against all the wickedness of humanity. The Christian gospel is that you need saving and I need saving. And a window has opened where if only I will call upon the name of the Lord, I will be safe on the day of judgment. And so finally... Won't you call on his name? Won't you turn to him and simply say the words you find throughout the Gospels? Save me. When you do that, you will be safe. Well, let me lead us in prayer. And then, Wes, do you want us to take questions today? I don't know where you've gone. Yeah, we're going to take them from the floor. From the floor. If anybody's got any questions from the floor, you can shout them out in a moment. But let me lead us in prayer. Thank you, our Father in heaven, for the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the sending of your Holy Spirit, and for these last days that we've been living in since Christ ascended. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, who has enabled the communication of the gospel across the globe. We thank you for this warning of the coming day of God's judgment. And we ask that you would help us uh, to call upon the name of the Lord 
for safety and to spread this message, this wonderful reality of an opportunity to be safe in Jesus' name. Amen. You said that every Christian now should be confident to be able to speak about the mighty works of Jesus. What if we're thinking, but I don't feel as confident about doing that as Peter seems to be in this speech. How can I be sure I've really got the spirit at work in me? How would you answer that? Um, I, I think I'd say two things. One is trust God. So the mark of Christian faith is not that I sit and wait for things to happen. It's that I act on what I've been told. And this is the age of the last days. And God has promised that he has poured out his spirit on every single believer. And we live by faith and not by feeling. And so now I am to act on what I've been told. I mean, actually, that is the mark of Christian or authentic Christian response throughout the whole of uh, the Christian gospel. It is taking God at his word and not doubting him. And do you know what you'll find? is As you take God at his word and actually step out and do it, you will find confidence grows, confidence grows. So that's one thing. The second thing is um, God uses means and you will grow in confidence and in faith as you hear what God has said. And so, I mean, the Apostle Paul says faith comes through hearing. And so I would encourage you strongly, um, if you don't feel confident at this stage, one, um, trust God and take him at his word. Two, um, make it your business to study his word and grow in certainty about the things that he has said. And that whole, this whole series is designed for that, that we, uh, that we actually get to grips with what the Christian gospel really is. I mean, next week, as we look at the Lord Jesus you know, and come face to face with Jesus and the evidence, I hope, it will build confidence.